everybody and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Ashley Mova and this is The Daily Show. We give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth. Coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And who thought something as stupid and small as this could bring so much freaking joy to the world? I'm, this thing is awesome. Also here is John Schnapp. Hey, what's going on? Everybody who spent that $150 and has an animal, like a cat or a dog, you've spent the best $150 of your life. <laughs> You're so much fun with your dog. Also, here's Mark Ellis. Yes, I want to thank all the Collider fans who came to my shows at the Kansas City Improv. They actually brought, a few of them brought toys that they got from Force Friday That's awesome. to the shows. Nice. It's pretty cool to see BB-8 watching me do stand-up. You know what? <laughs> speaking of fans, so Thursday night... Uh, was, of course, the midnight release for The Force Awakens toys. A bunch of these are so just just a few of the spoils of war that you see in front of <laughs> us here uh, from that night. But it was really funny because um, I went down to meet up with Ann and Ray, um, Ann, my wife, and, and, and Ray Ora back there. They were in line, and in front of them was uh, our friend Adrian Iscaria, producer Hitman. But also, it was so fun because I, I ran into... Um, Kyle Newman, director of Fanboys, who was also on our panel at Comic-Con, which is really cool, ran into Sam Witwer, who does the voice of the Emperor in a lot of the games, and he was uh, they, he's the one they model Starkiller after. When you see Sam, you're looking at Star, Star, uh, Starkiller, which is also pretty good. But also Simon Kimberg um, was there <laughs> in line, too, yeah. which is like so weird here at the Burbank Toys R Us, like just standing right there in front of my wife. And he said hi to you? You got to talk to he him? He did, and he's like, you're on Jedi Council. It's like, so Simon Kimberg watches Jedi Council, apparently. Oh, man, I got to step up my game. Yeah. Which I thought was pretty cool. I think Sam Whitmer also played China in Wrestling Isn't Wrestling. <laughs> Check him out in that. Well, yeah, Very that was Sam, wasn't yeah, fantastic it? role, amazing acting abilities, Sam Whitmer. So, China. <laughs> All right, let's start off the day. <laughs> All right, it's our first show of the week, so it's time for our weekly box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Coming in at number one this week, bumping out three-time champ straight out of Compton, is the faith-based film War Room. War Room went into expanded release this week, adding almost 400 additional screens over its week one release <coughs> to bring in a weekend total of $9.45 million. Falling into the number two position is straight out of Compton, making $8.85 million to bring its four-week domestic total up to $150 million. Coming in third spot is the Robert Redford film A Walk in the Woods, making $8.25 million. In fourth position is the new film The Transporter Refueled, making $7.2 million. And rounding out the top five is Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, bringing in an additional $7.1 million for a domestic total of $180 million and a worldwide total of over $511 million. John, what stands out to you in this week's box? Box office report. Well, Mission Impossible hanging in there in the top five is is really cool. I think it's its sixth week or mm. something. I'm not really sure. Crosses the five hundred million dollar <clears throat> worldwide mark. Full kudos to them. You know they're all well. They had already announced they're going to do a Mission Impossible six, and it's just a no brainer. Somehow, some way, these films get better and better and better. But what really stands out to me about the the box office this weekend, and it's the same kind of as the weekend last year of this same weekend, is. A $9 million movie is your number one movie? Really? $9 million is your number one movie. So it's, it's, but it's been a weak couple of weeks, right? When you got the transporter coming out and you got things like that and your only, you know, you know, bastion of hope is straight out of Compton, hanging in there, Mission Impossible, hanging in there. A couple of other titles, good titles hanging around in the top 10 for weeks and weeks and weeks. So that's pretty good. But, you know, you got to look at straight out of Compton. Straight out of Compton is, I mean, I think a lot of us expected big opening weekend numbers because of the subject material, but it has staying power. I mean, to be in, in its fourth or fifth week, still making close to double digits to the box office, that's a testimony to the fact that people are still going out to see it. They're telling other people to go see it. And I think that bodes really well for it. And obviously that applies to Mission Impossible as well. So that's what stands out to me. Schnapp, what about you? Yeah, <clears throat> I guess War Room stands out to me because when I my repeat viewings of Fireproof and Courageous, my favorite films <laughs> of the year so far, <laughs> Uh, from la the last few years. Or War Room, I just haven't gotten to see yet. So I'm really excited that it's number one. But aside from me <laughs> joking about things like that, um, straight out of Compton and Mission Impossible, that those are the, 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 they just have that strength, you know, of staying over, the strength of street knowledge. You know, it's like, 
That's my quote from Straight Outta Compton. If you guys, <laughs> <are familiar. laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm really happy that Mission Impossible is doing so well. Get going on the sixth movie already. I cannot wait for you to make a better sixth movie than the fifth one because that was better than the fourth one. So it really is. If you want to see them in ascending order and the best of order, watch one through five because then it just gets better. So what's odd about the movie? The term War Room is something I always associated with the NFL Draft, and now the movie War Room is going to do better than the movie about the NFL Draft Draft Day. Like it's going to do better <laughs> <That's> total, <right. laughs> and that that's it, it's it, it was shocking to me. And now I actually expected it to be number one because of all of the buzz around it, where it's like, I don't even know if it's a great movie. I haven't heard if it's a good movie, if it's even watchable, but people want to go see it. But the most shocking thing about this weekend was Walk in the Woods to me. Hmm. Like, it does prove that there's a little bit of star power left for Nick Nolte and Robert Redford, where they yeah. can make this tiny movie and people do want to go see it. This was a nice weekend for an older sect to go to the movies and just check out a film that they want to see. So there's still a little bit of juice in the guys from 48 Hours and from Butch Cassidy, that people <laughs> want to go see them do something. And the trailers were good. I mean, the yeah. trailers were good for it. But going back to War Room, it, it just it kind of reemphasizes something we mentioned last week. Don't underestimate the power of a film specifically tailored to any niche audience. If you can find, if, if you're a producer, and we see this happen all the time, mm -hmm. well, not just in religious circles, but others as well, where if you find that niche audience and you can make a film that really is, number one, targeted at and catering to that niche, you can make some money and you can you can make some noise and, and cause some waves. So it'll be interesting to see what happens next weekend. Um, once we got some other things, we see the visit coming into play, but we'll get right. to that in opening this week on Thursday. For now, what's next? While fans of the Hellboy series have been yearning for a third film, actor Ron Perlman has continued to discuss the project whenever given the opportunity. In a recent interview with Empire Magazine, the actor gave away some of the major plot details for a third film if it were to ever come to pass, including the role of the twins Hellboy and Liz found out they were having at the end of Hellboy 2. Perlman said the following, Guillermo told me what the resolve of the trilogy would look like in broad strokes, and it's such an amazingly theatrical cinematic idea that I found it essential that we do it. Holy S, he's the beast of the apocalypse. He has to take down civilization. He has to. It's non-negotiable. That's the foundation for the story, and that's why I think it would be a shame if we don't do it. The two twins, one would look like the mom, and one would look like the dad, and one of them was going to be completely effing corrupt, the other one angelic. Which one was which? Only Guillermo would make the effed up looking one be the angel. <laughs> so then that adds to the saga. Schnepp, do these comments increase or decrease your desire to see a Hellboy 3. I don't know if anyone's ever told Ron Perlman about spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> spoilers, Perlman. It's when you ruin the entire film before it comes out. Um, actually, it's been ruined for years because if you read the comics, you would know what that Hellboy is, the bringer of the apocalypse, and he grows the horns out. And Basically, I mean, I think what Perlman's doing is trying to at least rise, you know, raise up some kind of fervor to like, hey, can we see the end of this trilogy like it would be cool in my eyes to see the end of the hellboy trilogy done cinematically i just i just know that they're asking for so much money it's like 200 million or something and and the movie so far didn't do that box office wise so even with the the sales of dvd when hellboy 2 came out now nobody's buying you know that so it's a different marketplace i don't know how they'd raise the money I'd love to see it. So I'm with Perlman for like wanting to like put out a little more information on it and get people kind of re-excited about the idea of Hellboy 2. I don't know if it's ever going to happen though. Yeah, I I think the the comments make me a little bit more excited for the idea of a Hellboy right. because that is that sounds cool. That's kind of the kind of stuff we've been expecting to see, wanting to see, all that kind of stuff. But the realities are exactly what you pointed out. What they want to make those movies does not financially make sense for a studio. <clears throat> right. I remember, I think it was about a year ago, it was like the the chief over at Legendary Pictures, they, you know, there was this report came out that he had met with Guillermo del Toro and they talked a little bit about Hellboy. And like, basically, I'm paraphrasing, the conversation went like this. Guillermo, I, I'm the legendary guy, you're so fantastic. We love working with you, I've making to, movies I've with you. I've got the designs ready for Hellboy 3. Do you want to see my book? Yes, how much, uh, but how much is it going to cost? Uh, 200 million. But let's you know, you're an awesome filmmaker. Uh, can you we look at this? We love working with you. I know, but look at the design of the creature that I have. This is part of the $50 million. Wow, your imagination I, is so great. Uh, Isn't that wonderful? I do, yes. That'll look great on a bookshelf somewhere. Uh, okay. <laughs> but what certainly about, not with my $200 million. What That's about essential. Pacific Rim 2? <laughs> yes, Pacific uh, Rim 2. We'll, we can we'll do that. That's the And that's pretty much the conversation that the studios, and understandably totally. so, this isn't one of those things, why won't the studios just do, because it's going to lose them their shirts and they know it. I think if Guillermo del Toro 
was able to come, we've said this before, was able to come to Legendary or another studio and say, here's my design for Hellboy 3. We can make this for $105 million. I think he's going to get bites. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Guillermo del Toro, he's moving forward in his career. He wants to think bigger and grander. And I don't think any of us can fault him for that. Yeah. Just in the same way that I don't think any of us can fault a studio for saying, we don't think this is a sound financial investment. We don't think we can get our money back or make money on this. So, no. So, I, I see it as a no-fault situation. But... I still just can't see a reality in which a Hellboy works. Anyway, All right, think? then I'll take on the role of Guillermo's agent. Guillermo, <laughs> babe, love you to death. Legendary was blown away. They suggested Kickstarter. What do you think? <laughs> but you know what? When I read that, I, that, I, that got $20 from my pocket because now I'm more intrigued than I was before. I liked the, the first two Hellboy movies. Right. I didn't run out of the theater. Like, that's the greatest thing ever. But the imagination that was on display in those two movies made me want to go back to that world to some degree. Reading this further that for me, and I understand what you're saying about giving away spoilers, but if that was the premise of the new movie going in, right. like if you see a trailer for Hellboy 3 and it's set up that this is the bringer of the apocalypse, we have these two twins that are going back and forth, I want to see totally. that movie. Can it actually happen? I, I, I don't know the international draw that uh, that Hellboy is like I'm not sure if it's like a Terminator Genesis situation where it does okay here but then it really pulls in money overseas so I, I, I don't, don't think it did I don't I don't know because it's not that known of a property like a Terminator is so I'd love to see it in some capacity I just don't know that it's going to work all right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of Rash, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down, and those at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Speaking of sequels, tons of movie fans have been wanting to see. Academy Award-winning director Danny Boyle has constantly been asked about the possibility of a follow-up film to Train Spotting. A sequel to the original book exists titled Porno, which is said to be the basis for the possible sequel. However, now it appears a Train Spotting 2 may be closer to becoming reality than ever before. Recently at the Telluride Film Festival, Deadline again asked Boyle about the possible sequel to which he said the only obstacle obstacle now was getting the schedule of the four main actors worked out since two of the stars are in current running TV series. Johnny Lee Miller in Elementary and Robert Carlyle on ABC's Once Upon a Time. Mark Byers saw that a train spotting sequel will ever actually happen. You know what? I was reading these comments this weekend, and I kind of buy it now. I was just it's something about the way that Danny Boyle was talking about it, the way that these actors seem to want to return to that world as well. And plus, unlike a Hellboy three situation, this ain't going to cost a lot of cheddar to make. Right. It's going to be dirt cheap. All the actors would be willing to, or, or Ewan McGregor would be willing to be like, "Yeah, I can take a pay cut to do this movie again." I hope they get it rolling sooner or later because it makes sense to. If they can get Miller and Carlisle's TV schedules to work out with shooting, because Ewan McGregor <coughs> might have another movie he's doing. In a couple of years is going to take a lot of time. So I hope they get this done because this is something that is a real possibility. You know, it's, it's funny. I never really thought this was a movie that could ever actually happen, but I am coming around on that. As far as you, McGregor, taking a pay cut, I don't think his paycheck demands are all that high right now, but something could be coming on the horizon that might yeah, change that. A little, a little something. Yeah. A little something, but it's not like Hugh McGregor's been tearing up the box office with his films when he's like the fourth credited guy in, uh, oh, what was that Johnny Depp movie that was just out? Mordecai? Mordecai. Was, was he in that? Yes. Well, wow. um, let's, let's just forget about let's Mordecai. Let's just forget about yeah. Mordecai. But you know, with the way Danny Boyle talks, look, he's doing one of two things here, and either way, it's genius. On the one hand, this is something that's actually happened, because if you take the comments at face value, what it sounds like is like, he has been making phone calls, and he has been talking to people, and there's some studio involvement. And when he says something like, at this point, the only potential snag right. here is a schedule of the star performers. Obviously, McKid wouldn't be in the, uh, wouldn't be in the sequel, right. no. but... I mean, that leads uh, lends a lot of credibility to the th idea that we could get one. Now, on the other hand, Boyle may well know, and this is, would be genius too, he may well know this is something that can't happen. So what do you do is he keeps the movie in everybody's heads, he keeps everybody talking about his movie and how great the original was, but he knows it'll never happen, so he throws out some lame duck excuse about, I, I, we just don't know if we can ever get the schedules to work out, and he knows very well it's never going to happen. I'm going to say bye. Mm -hmm. I actually, it sounds like this is creeping ahead. It's creeping along. If Boyle does want to do it as much as it sounds like he wants to do it, you're right. You can make this movie probably for $30 million, and you could probably assume you can get your money back on that. Maybe I'm being naive, but for now I'm going to say bye. 
I'm going to buy it. I mean, I just think Danny Boyle is one of our greatest directors around right now, starting from Shallow Grave with Ewan McGregor. And Train Spotting is one of my favorite films. So I, I'm a little reticent to see them do a sequel because it's like it's sort of like one of the Matrix. The Matrix, like you're like, oh, don't make the sequels bad because then I, I just have to throw those away and just only have. I like having Train Spotting, and I don't want to see a sequel. Really, I don't need to see what these guys are doing twenty years later. But if it is the original crew and it is Danny Boyle and everybody is on board for doing something and they think they have a quality project, then then I'm all for it. So, all right, what's next? The upcoming Johnny Depp film Black Mass has just played this past weekend at the aforementioned Telluride <laughs> Film Festival, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive to the point that many critics who saw the film are saying they will be shocked if the film doesn't get a Best Picture nomination and actors Johnny Depp and Joel Edgerton don't get Best Actor and Supporting Actor nominations at the upcoming Oscars. The Hollywood Reporter called Depp a slam dunk for a Best Actor nomination and that Joel Edgerton steals the show. John Byersell, these reports about Black Mask coming out of Telluride. Bye, 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 bye. How long have we been waiting for this? How long have we been waiting to see Johnny Depp get out of the crazy? I mean, obviously this is makeup, but this right. isn't Edward Scissorhands, Captain Jack Black, right. um, whatever that- Swirly mustache. Mu <laughs> whatever that vampire yeah. movie was. Uh, we're talking about Mordecai again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mordecai. Mordecai. I mean- Forget all, we have been waiting and talking about, it feels like for years that we've been doing the show, when will Johnny Depp get back to being Johnny Depp? When are we gonna see that brilliance? We thought maybe we're gonna see it in that mobster movie that he did a couple of years ago. Public uh, Enemies. Public Enemies. Mm -hmm. Bleh. We Transcendence. Thought, we thought <laughs> maybe we're gonna see it in Transcendence. Bleh. And it gets to the point where we start thinking, I, I, do we have to start having the conversation about maybe we don't get excited about hearing that Johnny Depp's in the film and then we see everything for Black Mask and we're all like, okay, hold on a second. This looks good. This, number one, sounds really good. Trailers have been coming out. They look awesome. But Public Enemies looked awesome too. Uh, Transcendence also looked awesome as well. And we were let down, so I don't know. And now... People have actually seen it, and they're raving about it. And what really excited me about this, I have been a big Joel Edgerton fan for a long time. That movie he did with Tom Hardy, Warrior, is still one that I don't think nearly enough people have watched or appreciate. you got to check it out. Edgerton's a monster in that. It's just great. Hearing them say that Joel Edgerton just steals it. I mean, when you say that about a guy where the lead actor you're also saying is a slam dunk for a nomination for Best Actor, that's saying something. Right. I am beyond excited now. I've been wanting this movie to be good. I didn't know how high my belief in it was, but hearing these comments excites me. I'm pumped. Big buy for me, Mark. Yeah, and this is not just a two-horse show. There's a lot of great actors in this movie. It's a tentative buy for me. I'm not going to go New York Stock Exchange for buy, buy, buy just yet because, again... This is really maybe the first Oscar contender that we've seen come out during Oscar season. So people are going to get excited. We're done with the blockbusters. August was a very tough month on all of us because of Fantastic Four and a number of other movies that just came out and were disappointments. So now you get to go to a film festival and you get to see a movie that's actually good with solid performances. You might have a tendency to oversell how great that is. Having said all that, I am looking forward to Black Mass. I saw the trailer in a movie theater for the first time this weekend, and I was like, I'm, I'm on board with this mm -hmm. movie. I'm still a little reticent because the makeup still looks like makeup to me. It just doesn't look like it. It doesn't. There's something like like off about it. it. Almost looks like it's a CGI skin or something. I just can't quite buy it. But Depp looks great in it. Edgerton looks great. So I believe that these guys are right now going to be the front runners. But there's so many great movies, hopefully great, that are going to be coming out before the Oscar nominations get announced. So I'm not going to totally buy it, but it's a tentative buy for me. Snap. I'm going to buy it. I mean, it's from the trailers alone, and I just saw the trailer in the in the theater for the first time as well mm -hmm. this weekend. Did notice they forgot to put. Put his contacts in in one shot so if you watch that trailer you'll see he doesn't have the gray it's like his regular eyes i'm like they better fix that in see in the movie because that at least to me it popped out but anyway aside from that one glaring mistake that trailer is incredible uh, you're right johnny depp is like completely transformed into this role he looks like some kind of weird vampire i mean that's why it reminds me of a creepy old vampire it's uh and a real vampire not like a fake you know scoopy like gothy vampire this is like what a vampire would look like is this version so i can't wait to see the film and whether or not he's going to get an oscar i don't know but it's not it, all the performances look like they're on point it looks like a really good film just from the just from watching the trailer so i'll buy it please be good yeah please be good we've been waiting for this for I so long i think this is one of those 
situations too where it's like if you're a sports fan and finally like the season starts you're just so happy to be seeing football again it's like it doesn't really matter if the football's right. great as long as it looks like football you're gonna be pumped this looks like an oscar movie it does all right folks hey the next little item we want to bring up here is kind of a little bit off the beaten path for us but i thought it was really worth addressing there was a really great article that i stumbled across in the hollywood reporter that basically talked about movie tracking and the tracking. Now, tracking is basically, if you boil it down, it's what the industry is predicting a certain film will do at the box office and how well it's going to do opening weekend, all that kind of stuff. Now, there has been a long-standing formula, tried and true, that for the very most part has been quite reliable and pretty accurate. Obviously, not always 100%. Any man-made thing is not. But the article in The Hollywood Reporter was basically pointing out that this summer, this year, Tracking has been ridiculously off from like 20% off for movies like um, Terminator Genesis, which was way lower, for movies like Straight Out Compton that's ended up being much higher, to like the big granddaddy, which was Jurassic World. Right. Tracking for Jurassic World had it at like 125 million opening weekend, which is insanely good numbers on its own, but it ended up making over 200 million. Where was tracking and all that kind of stuff? Plus, it pointed out a lot of big films that came out that were tracking at certain numbers and then came out really low. Now, the, the, the crux of this article, though, was pointing out that a lot of the studio heads are now acknowledging Rotten Tomatoes and instant fan social media reaction is what is killing a lot of these movies that they're putting out that they thought, look, we have this formula. You make trailers a certain way. You put certain people in it. You put certain music in the trailers. You do this type of advertising. And then the tracking says you can expect to make this much this particular weekend. What this article is saying now is that that trend is becoming unreliable. No longer can you just formulate, put together, take this formula about how to market this movie, and then you can count on this amount of money being made opening weekend. Now it's introducing new you know, paradigms that are outside of the studio's control. Mm. Rotten Tomatoes, which is, of course, a, a conglomeration of all the critic ratings from around the web, online, print, whatever, and the social media stuff, to the point now that the article actually pointed out that for the first time ever, two films this summer actually used Rotten Tomatoes scores in their marketing. Mm. That That's the type of day and era that we are living in now. So, Mark, you had a chance to look at this article. What did you take away from it when you, were, when you read it through? I think not every formula is Coca-Cola and that occasionally you do have to update it with new technology like Rotten Tomatoes or, you know, the term word of mouth gets thrown around and it's kind of a catch-all for social media. But word of mouth used to just be something you didn't have to incorporate because word of mouth was me leaving a theater and calling my friends John Schnapp and John Campy and saying, you guys got to see this movie. Now, word of mouth is also social media where you have access to literally everyone on on the planet, whether it's a Twitter account or a Facebook account or an Instagram account, I take that me tweeting my emoji for a lot of movies can start to factor in and everybody else starts to do just, this is what my face looks like after a movie. You can express how you felt about a movie so many different ways and people care about what fans think. They're not just worried about what critics think. If they are, that's why they go to Rotten Tomatoes now. So it's definitely a changing of the guard. It's something that I don't think you need to, it's not necessarily broken, but it is something that, need to be, that needs to be tweaked when you're talking about how you track a movie. It's still exciting to see a movie like Jurassic World beat box office predictions. So it doesn't have to be an exact science for me. I like to see what a movie's tracking at. Then I like to see that there is a social media component that can either elevate it or hurt it. You know, what stands out to me about the story is that I often will get in debates with uh, like friends of mine or people who tweet me randomly and say, you know... You shouldn't listen to what other people are saying. You shouldn't listen to critics. You should just watch the trailers and decide for yourself. And that mentality has always driven me kind of nuts because what that is saying basically is you're telling me that the only influence you should allow over your decision-making process is the corporate masters, the people who put these trailers together. Theirs is the only voice you should listen to. That to me is, personally, that to me is flawed thinking. To me, you should be going out and seeing what, you know, this huge array of film critics are saying corporately and together. You should go out and listen to the people, friends of yours that you've, or people you trust on Twitter or social media who see it and listen to their points of view. Don't just listen to the people who stand to make money off you going to see the movie. That's not the way to do it. That should be one of your considerations, absolutely. There should be a balance. What I was telling the guys pre-show here is that what I love about this new trend, 
that understand the studios are realizing now people look at Rotten Tomato scores. People look at their Twitter feeds and seeing what other people are saying and making some decisions based on that. What that tells me and what excites me is it says this. Movie studios, you want to know what a great marketing campaign for your film is? Make a good movie. That is the best marketing campaign you can do. Make a great movie. Worry less about how can we spin this actor and promote this and create trailers and a marketing campaign loose that will equal this box office number. Those numbers are becoming more and more, those formulas are becoming more and more obsolete, which is a good thing. And becoming more about did you make a great movie? We're not there yet. There are lots of great movies that nobody gets out to see at this point. But I think if studios can now start to tune in, like what they do, start using those Rotten Tomato scores, start pumping up the fact that people are talking on Twitter about it. If studios can tune in to positive word of mouth and positive reviews, not just putting up some, look, any movie can find one film critic who liked it. Like because all film is subjective. So you're going to find at least one or two and put up their quotes on the movie posters. Those are becoming less relevant now because the audience is cluing into the fact that that doesn't mean anything anymore. Show me a Rotten Tomatoes score. Show me what a suit-wearing, you know, kind of uppity uh, James Rocky would write and what a sometimes mohawk-sporting, grungy kind of Jimmy O would write right. with sometimes some clueless guy like Christian Harloff <laughs> might write or some idiot like me, what I'm writing. Show me what all these various types of people who from different walks of life known as film critics are saying collectively, and they collectively say this is an 87, or they collectively say like like 90% of them give this movie a positive review, that when you follow your Twitter feed and stuff like that, this could be the dawn of a glorious new day. And hopefully now, studios will put less attention to that. The, what's the formula for marketing this film to make 50 million compared to how can we just make this the best damn movie we can because that is going to be our best marketing pitch. Anyway, Schnepp, you read the article. What did you think? I love the article. It was great. And it's also, it just, it really spoke to me because uh, critics and people who make movies, 89% Rotten Tomatoes. What's up? Oh, uh, for yeah. my film, The Death of Superman Lives, what happened? I, I was the other 11%. I, I, John I really, <laughs> just really didn't like it for some reason. But... Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, and I actually followed all those different critics and, and read their reviews, uh, some negative, mostly positive. So it was a really good way for me to be able to track it and see how, and also read the fan reviews. So, I mean, it's really helpful for the filmmakers as well, but it's also, it's it puts your, it puts if you're a filmmaker or a studio, it puts you on the pulse of what people are saying immediately. So as opposed to like what tracking numbers or what you would call bean counting, it's like some of that doesn't really relate to anything because it's like weird algorithms as opposed to actual people seeing the film and talking about it. And those people like, when I was a lot younger, I would read all of Roger Ebert's reviews. And, and a lot of times I would completely disagree with him, but why I would re read a lot of different critics' reviews is so I could get an insight into the film. It didn't affect me as to how I felt about the film, but being a film junkie, I would like, I wanted to know other people's opinions, either positive or negative. And I've, I've loved movies that other people have hated, and I've hated movies that other people have loved, but I've read their reviews and, oh, I see why they liked or hated that, or, oh, I agree with them about this, but because of this other thing that overrides it for me personally. So... I think Rotten Tomatoes, <clears throat> excuse me, is really, really important, as well as all these other critics who are now part of our online world. Even us, we're like a, a small part of it, but you know, we're, we're we see movies all the time. You guys, Schmoes knows, give reviews about films immediately, like sometimes about a week or so before the movie comes out, and your fans get a chance to be like, "Oh, I like what Ellis said about that because they follow your vibe," or like they're my, "I hate what Ellis said. I'm going to see it anyway because I want to say Ellis, you're wrong," or whatever. It's like it's a good way to gauge things. So I, I'm I love that article. I just like the term "following Ellis's vibe." That sounds good to me. <laughs> it also proves, too, that studios can't hide films the way they used to. Like, you have to... Now, if you don't show your movie to critics or to fans ahead of time, it is such a red flag, more so than it used to be, where people just couldn't find a review. I wonder how this movie is. I can't... I don't seem to see anybody writing about it yet. Now people know that the reason why is because they don't want it to be on Rotten Tomatoes before the movie comes out. Right. I remember a few years ago, I was talking with a rep from one of the studios, uh, because at the time, this is about five years ago, when there was this mentality, was, ah, what critics say doesn't really matter. And this one person, this one studio told me, we know there's about a 10% swing. If a movie was, let's for argument's sake, if the movie was just on its own going to make 100 million, if the reviews are really good, we can count on making 110. If the reviews are really bad, it can drop down to 90 for about a $20 million swing. I don't think that number applies anymore. I think that number is much larger now. Because one Fox rep was talking about how, look, the tracking for Fantastic Four was $50 million opening weekend. It actually made less than half of that at 24. Mm. And the one thing the Fox rep said is, 
had the Rotten Tomatoes reviews been great and the word of mouth had been good, we would have exceeded that projection number of $50 million. Instead, we got people losing their jobs over it. And so that is a reflection of the coming reality, and I welcome that reality where we're not just listening to the corporate machine anymore tell us what movies to see. We're actually listening to our you know, our, our friends, the people we know, the people we trust, the people we follow, all that kind of stuff. Those voices are now having an important part, and I think that is the start of something really good. If the studios can learn how to tap into that as well, I think that would be great. It's it's a fun time to yeah. be a movie fan now because actually the fans do get to influence so much more about how a movie does, and that in turn factors into if a movie stays in theaters longer or if it gets a sequel. So you do have a lot of power now. Have some self-efficacy out there, movie watchers. <laughs> All right, folks, we reached out part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Just send on in your questions, and maybe you'll see yours on the show. So, Ashley, what do we got today? No, Quisada writes, Hey, Collider crew, a few weeks ago on Mailbag, I was watching John Campia's rant on movie studios spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a lot of their films, causing movie ticket prices to dramatically increase. My question is, do you think we'll ever see movie ticket prices go back to being below $10, or do you think all is doom and they will continue to increase? Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, first, um, it's important to note that I believe the national ticket average uh, across the nation, like if you live here in L.A., it's expensive. If you live in New York, it's expensive. Across the U.S., I believe you looked up that the average movie ticket price is nine dollars and something right now. So anyway, take that for what it is. Some are cheaper, some are more expensive. Depends on the time of day you go. Yada yada yada. Um, yeah, basically what the question is, I went off on Mailbag one day about how, look, this the lack of discipline of movie studios spending more and more and more and more and more money on these movies and giving more and more money to, to movie stars. Well, we saw the, the, that those numbers are getting reined in a little bit. That has a direct connection to the overall economics of the movie industry, and it always comes back down to the movie viewer. We are the ones who pay for it. So if you want to know why, hey, why was this ticket, which was $9 just a couple years ago, now $12? Then don't talk about how Robert Downey Jr. earned ninety million dollars for you know for doing uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Don't say it's okay that a movie studio spends three hundred million dollars on something and then complain that we're spending twelve dollars on a movie ticket. There is a connection between this. It's not the only thing. Absolutely not. There's a lot of other variables. But the whole point of my rant was that there is a connection between how much money studios pay to make their movies and what we end up paying as movie tickets because studios need to make that money back. And then you have the movie theater chains that need to make an income as well and all that kind of stuff. Do I ever think we'll start to see those ticket prices go down? I don't. I think it would be naive to think that they ever will. But we can hopefully slow down the rate. When movie ticket prices are increasing at a much faster pace than the cost of inflation, then there's a systemic problem involved here. I think we can see a day where we see how fast movie ticket prices rise get significantly slowed down. I don't think we're ever going to see them start going backwards. I think maybe movie theaters can introduce promotions where, hey, Mondays, go go back to $2 Tuesdays. We're never going to see $2 Tuesday, but <laughs> introduce a $6 Tuesday, or maybe we'll see promotions and specials. But overall, I don't think we're going to see the trend reverse. I just think the best we can hope for is to see it <clears throat> slow down. Anyway, Mark, what do you think we're going to see with movie ticket pricing trends? It's so hard to recreate the movie theater experience. And even when you look at down the road, like is something like Netflix or on demand, or will you eventually get to see first run movies in your home or in a theater and have the choice? That is the scenario where I can see the ticket prices at a movie theater going down. But I don't see it happening in the near future. I think it's a fair price to actually pay to see a movie like 10, 12 bucks. I think that's a fair price to see a good movie movie what gets me the popcorn and the soda jesus h cristo i mean we're that's that's too much money it's it just costs too much money to buy a popcorn in a theater now so that's what i'm more worried about than the ticket prices there's also ways to get in cheap like like you can you could find some some sort of groupon or something like that or find a theater that does have a cheaper rate it might not be a first run movie it may have been out for a while but there's ways to go to a movie for cheap eating at the movie that's a different situation Schnapp. Well, we know the concessions is where the theaters actually make their markup. Right. It's like the movies, they barely make anything. So it is like that fight that like, hey, I get it. it's like popcorn and water for like 20 bucks. You're basically that's what you're giving the movie theater. You're like, look, you can have that. They don't get much of that. They movie don't ticket get price. almost yeah. nothing of the actual movie. But look, I would love to see them do a double feature Tuesday or something like match up like Transporter Refueled and Hitman, like two movies that are similar in tone 
or like, you know, or and quality. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> let's not get into that. Uh, well, let's, you know, like Jurassic World. What would you mash that up with? Hey, show Jurassic Park. Bring that one out and do a double feature. Just do it every Tuesday and say, hey, for, you know, come on down and we'll we do these limited double features for the same price. I don't know. There's different ways to get to get the audience back to come to get into the theater and to enjoy a double feature. Double features are really fun. I don't know if we're ever going to see movies go down in price. Anyone who lives in the Midwest or in the middle of America, you guys are the nine dollar people. We're like the twelve to fifteen dollar people here in L.A. and New York. <laughs> we we pay a lot, a lot more to see movies. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it sounds it's so like, awful. I'm a fifteen dollar guy. No, no, <laughs> you're nine dollar people. No, I'm actually no, saying they're lucky because we're like every time we go to the theater before we buy our concessions, it's like forty. Bucks, you're like, yeah. yo, that's expensive. So, John Snip said we were nine dollar people. I, know. I can't believe you said we we're nine dollar people. Can I just edge you up to ten dollar people? I'm just saying, you're making that money. Please send the extra five bucks to me so I can go see more movies. But, uh, yeah, I don't think the prices are going to go down, yeah. yeah. And you know, to, to, to make sure it doesn't sound like I'm trying to be alarmist or anything like that, I still think I said this on a show a couple weeks ago. I still think the cost of a movie ticket is a great value. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, we were just in Vegas this past weekend, and my wife and her friend decided they wanted to go see the Britney Spears show. It was $110 a ticket. Ooh. I ate one meal at Gordon Biersch. I was there for about 35 minutes. cost me $24 for, for the meal that I had. I mean, or... But then again, you have to be somebody like me who I love the movie going experience. For me to go to a movie and put down 12 bucks for two hours, 15 minutes of hopefully great entertainment that's going to whisk me away and all that kind of stuff, I still contend for entertainment dollar values, that's a, that's a really good value. The other cost you have to remember too for these movie theaters is also that's a lot of real estate. Movie theaters are huge mm -hmm. complexes mm -hmm. with massive amounts of staff. And we as audience members, we should be doing this. We demand better quality pictures, better seating, better audio. So we see, you know, obviously there are bad movie theaters around, but we see movie like you get the AMC Primes, you get the new IMAX and stuff like that. These all cost money. It's So there's a lot of things that go into making a movie ticket cost what it costs. I just agree with these guys. It's not something, it's not a trend we're going to see reverse. All right, what's next? Corey writes, hey, Collider crew, my question is, with the recent news about the restructuring going on at Marvel, one bit of news that caught my eye was that Ike Perlmutter will still have control over Marvel's TV division. So I was wondering, do you guys think we will see a division between the TV and movie aspects of the MCU, and could this change hurt the chances of the Defenders or Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. popping up in Infinity War or any future Marvel movies? Um, I have always said that I am doubtful you're going to see, um, like for instance, I still don't believe Daredevil's gonna show up in Infinity War. I do not believe any of the new Netflix heroes are going to show up in a Marvel Cinematic Universe thing. Kevin Feige, at that Marvel event, at the El Capitan, he said something that I think carried a lot more meaning than what he said. Somebody asked him a question about the TV universe and Kevin Feige says, look, I have nothing to do with the TV stuff. That That's their thing, I do movies to show that there's not really, even though they are the same cinematic universe, there's not really a connected open line of communication between television and movies. Television, the TV shows, will dance around and form their stuff to show that they connect to the movies, but if you watched Age of Ultron, it did nothing to show that it connected to the TV show. Any kind of implied connection was all done because the TV show made their show to make it look like it connected. Um, and you know, I said this about Daredevil. While there may have been a newspaper article on the back wall with, uh, you know, the Leviathan crashed on the ground and a reference to the Battle of New York, just to make it clear this is the same cinematic universe, they did not go... Daredevil never went out of its way to show that, hey, you know what? Thor lives in this world or anything like that. And now with this separation, and I think I mentioned this when the first story came out, where Perlmutter is no longer overseeing Kevin Feige, but he is overseeing television... Mm -hmm. I think this just lessens the chances that we're going to see any of these TV properties cross over into the movies. I believe the TV properties will still be very anxious to pull in elements from the movies into their shows, but I think that's going to continue to be a one-way street. I don't think you're going to see the movies do the opposite. But maybe I'm wrong about that. Mark, what perspective do you have on this? I don't think it's going to change that much because I don't think it had a lot to do with each other in the first place, particularly when you're talking about the movies. I mean, that's what that that's what is the concern to me as somebody who doesn't watch the TV shows as much as I get so excited to see the films, is that these films already have source material to go on that they have to stay faithful to. So now throwing another wrench in there and saying, oh, no, now you have to make sure that this action coincides with everything 
thing that happened on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or on Daredevil, something like that. It just muddies the water further. What would give me hesitation, even more so than I already have, is that, you know, Perlmutter and Feige might not have the best relationship. So if that's why Perlmutter is now just overseeing TV and Kevin Feige doesn't have to report to him anymore, it might be like, oh, now we're going to get these two in a meeting. And Perlmutter says, hey, remember all those ideas I shot down of yours? Can we put Daredevil in a movie? That'd be, that'd be awesome. Like, I think it'd be cool to see Daredevil or to see the, the Punisher in Infinity War. But if I'm putting my fantasy team together, I'm leaving them on the bench. Schnapp? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I actually like the separation. I like that Daredevil is part of the same world, but they don't ever have to cross over. I mean, Daredevil's not going to be like on Asgard. Why would he be? You know, it's like <laughs> there's certain things that are like, I think the cinematic universe are dealing with the bigger story elements. And I think it makes sense that the TV series like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. are going to like take from that and like add and like plus their shows from the things that dropped off of Age of Ultron or whatever is going to be happening with Civil War. There's going to be ramifications, whatever they're doing to build up the idea of what an inhuman is that eventually when they finally get to the Inhumans, I'm sure the Inhumans movie will be a standalone movie and not have anything really reflective with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., unless you've already been watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., they'll be like these little Easter eggs in there. Oh, yeah, that's this guy, Lash, or that's, you know, they'll drop that in. Then it'll just be naturally there. So I don't really uh, have any trepidations of the, the the separation because they've already made it really clear that the cinematic universe stands on its own. The television universe, though part of that same cinematic universe, doesn't, you know, they're, they're non -ref they, they don't go back and forth. It's a drop down. You know, you got the movies and then the television shows because they have 22 episodes to deal with it. It's like, oh, we'll incorporate Sif into our story or this and that. And it just makes the TV shows better and it doesn't hurt the movies. You know what it reminds me of? I think that maybe this is a really bad analogy, but this is the way I kind of think about it right now. The movies are like a successful series of novels. The TV shows are like fan fiction. And, and I don't mean that in sense of quality. What I mean that in sense is the novels do their thing. They just do whatever they're doing. And then people, like fans, write fan fiction to coordinate and center their universes around what is happening in the real book series. Right. But the real book series doesn't then look down at the fan fiction and says, oh, they introduced a new character named Rex in the fan fiction. Let's talk about Rex in the real... Nah, and that's the way the relationship works right now, the way I perceive it at any rate, between the Marvel Cinematic Movies and the television universe. You see the television universe scrambling to make sure it reflects that we are a part of this universe with the movies, but you don't see the movies doing anything to reflect that we are a part of the same cinematic universe with the TV shows. Yeah, the, the one the one difference, I love that analogy, the one difference is that if you're writing fan fiction, then, then Marvel would have no stake in your fan fiction doing well or not doing well. But Marvel does care about their TV shows doing well. So you might see a reference to Daredevil for that very reason that oh we want to make sure you guys watch our Netflix shows too but I mean look you're, you're right Schnapp. it's like the in the movies they're going up there's there's entire cities that are levitating they're going up against Thanos in Infinity War right. but it doesn't diminish the value of a human life that there is stuff going on in Hell's Kitchen that is hurtful to people so we need to save every life we're not just we're, superheroes aren't just buying in bulk it's like I care as much about some country and I don't care about individual stories anymore no I care about saving that that grandma and her cat that's stuck in a tree like we mm -hmm. care about all this stuff we're superheroes that is an awesome point oh god I, I thank think, goodness i think, <laughs> I think you, you you raised such a great issue i think if like in dare this is part of what makes daredevil such a good show was the fact that it had so much separation because yes. you're right i think if thor suddenly showed up in episode two Ruined. to have this talk about talking about universal conquest then i think for the audience member that would subjectively downplay the value of the life of the nurse that daredevil has to go the universe is at stake but what Daredevil has done is it made these stories matter. And these things that right. he's involved with in individualized matter and count. I never even thought about it on that level till you brought it up. That's a great That's point. That's why I'm on the show. Hey. You know what else you know what else walked that line very well was Ant-Man, though, because Ant-Man was a smaller story. It was, you know, oh, we gotta go in and steal this suit, but it also had universal implications because of what that power was. So right. that's why it but it factors more into the cinematic universe than I think Daredevil might. I think something interesting to watch will be Star Wars because they're doing everything canon, so the TV shows are going to relate somehow to the movies, but the movies will all be standalone. But then you can, like, when you if you watch Rebels, it'll somehow relate because they've already introduced Darth Vader and all these other things, and they're saying all these things are part of the new canon. So right. I guess mm -hmm. that's the same way you could look at the Marvel movies. Marvel <laughs> movies are canon, and then the TV shows are just kind of like, you know, using that as a direction to spin their their entire season of 22 episodes or 10 episodes off of.
All right, what's next? Uh, last question comes from Lexi Howe, and they write, Hi, Collider Movie Crew. You spoke about the use of subtitles in one episode of Movie Talk, but the way you guys talked about it was the use of foreign films. I have two hearing disabilities and can only watch movies if they have subtitles. While some theaters, hint, hint, many AMC theaters, have accessibility devices, many do not. I was wondering if you thought it would be a good idea to do showings of movies with the subtitles on screen. I'm not talking about in every single theater, but maybe one or two per location. I know it would be a huge advantage for anyone else who has hearing problems, but to those who do not, it may seem like an inconvenience. What do you think? Thanks and keep up the great work. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for, for that for that message and for bringing up a, an issue. I don't think I'd really thought about it in those terms before, which is awesome. There's two trains of thought here that go through my head when I hear this. My one train of thought is the more negative one, which is, well, look, it all comes down to dollars and cents. If a movie theater chain can can you know come up with a way to do it, and I don't think that they can, to get enough people into the theater to justify taking up a screen and the staff and the manpower and whatever, instead of playing Jurassic World or another copy of Straight Outta Compton or Walk in the Woods or whatever, then that would hinder the chances for something like that happening. Do they think they can actually get people in? So that's the negative part. But the positive part goes back to what we were talking about. Look, the number one movie in the nation right now is War Room. And we talked a little bit about don't underestimate what can happen when you have a niche audience and you just target that niche audience and you go after them that you can have results. I think, actually, in a positive side, that if you're at a movie theater in Los Angeles and you say, hey, everybody's been wanting to see you know, the new Mission Impossible film, well, guess what? Sundays, we have screenings, Sunday afternoons, for, our, for, for the big films that are going to be subtitled for our hearing impaired. Now, I know some theaters, like in AMC theaters, they have some specific theaters that have hearing aids to help with it and all that kind of stuff, which is great. We're seeing movie theaters more and more being concerned about the issue of accessibility for all their potential audience members. But I think what you bring up is a really cool idea. If a movie theater chain and a studio can partner with them to really get behind, market it, let the people know in that niche group, whether it's a hearing impaired niche group or whatever, to say, we have a screening here for you. It can be successful, and that would take care of my first negative thought. So I think it's a really neat idea, Mark. Yeah, for blockbusters and indie films alike, I mean, you want to be part of the conversation. When a big movie comes out, you want to be able to talk about it with your friends, regardless of whether you're hearing impaired or not. So it actually is a great point. And let's think about the worst case scenario. Let's say that Star Wars The Force Awakens comes out in a movie theater on eight screens. Okay, if one of those screens had subtitles on it, is it the worst thing in the world for me to not be able to get a ticket for any other seven movies to go see it in that theater? Like, if, as long as you still have the sound on, that, that'd be kind of cool. It actually might help for something like Star Wars when the, you have to learn how to spell all the names of the new characters anyway. So <laughs> it, actually, it, it actually might improve the experience in some movies. So I think it's a great call. I love it. I love the idea of subtitle Sunday. Like just do at seven o'clock across the board, every single film is subtitled. Nowadays, every single film is pretty much electronic. It's digital. Yes. It's, we're not projecting film anymore. It's a digital print. DCP is what it's called. And and I think it's really easy. Almost every film that you see has already got the closed captioning subtitles in English already done. So it's just like literally turning them on or off. Basically, it's a function. I think if theaters try it out and let people know who, ha who need to have subtitles, hey, on Sunday at 7 o'clock, every single one of these movies is subtitled. You could see a rise in, uh, in, uh, in movie going on Sunday, and it would also be really helpful. Thanks so much for the question. All right, folks, that'll do it for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films are playing out at our friends over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and of course, your movie ticket information. If you're a big fan of movies and television in the world of entertainment, you got to make sure that you bookmark our website, collider.com. Make sure you're over there, bookmark, check it every day. They are doing a fantastic job of keeping you up to date by the minute on all the great things going on in the world of entertainment. Entertainment. Most importantly, guys, subscribe to this YouTube channel, keeping you up to date on everything going on over here at Collider Video. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. Uh, this weekend, we'll be at Long Beach Comic Con selling our film, The Death of Superman Lives. Uh, what happened? Uh, rated 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, I'm going to use that on our new promo cards. Just, uh, just you know, lit off a fire for me. And we'll also have the theater playing here in L.A. 
I'm sorry, it'll be playing in a theater here in LA at the Music Hall. Uh, in uh, I think it's on Wilshire. It's a Lemley's Music Hall, so you can check it out September 25th to October 1st, actually in a movie theater, so check it out. And of course, sitting over here on my right, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? Well, you can't really review stand-up on Rotten Tomatoes, but nobody's brought a tomato to my show yet to throw at me. That's good. I'll be at the Syracuse Funny Bone. They just had a show on Sunday this weekend, too, so Friday through Sunday. Catch me there online, 5150 Ellis. Our lovely host today is Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And uh, you can find me on the various social media networks on Facebook and on Twitter at John Campion. And I just want to mention, last week I mentioned I was doing a new Kickstarter for my upcoming novel, The Pride. Uh, we had a target goal of $12,000. You have 30 days to hit it. And you guys helped me hit it in four days. Bang! So thank you so much for that. The campaign still keeps going on. We're now looking at stretch goals. If you're interested in my novel, The Pride, or if you'd like to contribute, just go to Kickstarter and search for The Pride and you should be able to find it there, no problem. So that'll do it for us, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for Collider Video. Bye-bye.